You're listening to an exclusive podcast from the Zoomer Podcast Network, home of great shows like Ages and Icons, featuring in-depth interviews with cultural luminaries from the Zoomer generation, and The Conspiracy Show, where host Richard Serrett uncovers the out of sight and unexplained. Find them and many other fantastic podcasts by searching for the Zoomer Podcast Network in your favorite podcasting app. You're listening to an exclusive podcast of Fight Back on Zoomer Radio. Heard weekdays from noon to one. Now, Fight Back with Libby Snymer on Zoomer Radio. Good afternoon, welcome, and Merry Christmas. Health Canada gave us all a Christmas present. The Moderna vaccine is now approved, and unlike the Pfizer version, it does not have difficult transport and storage requirements. And that means we can start vaccinating our most vulnerable in long-term care, where the outbreaks and the death toll look like a nightmare repeat of the first wave. Meanwhile, we set another record, yet another record of new infections as the holiday is beginning. We're still seeing lineups at GTA stores that are still open, and that's no surprise on Christmas Eve. And the latest scary talk is about the new mutation of the virus. Actually, I believe that's plural. There are several mutations with a new variant in Africa, the latest one. The government has extended the suspension of incoming air traffic from the UK until January 6th. Will that do any good? And what about Premier Ford's demands for testing at the airport? Is is that going to solve the problem? Is that where we have the biggest problem? The numbers to call 416-360-0740, toll free 1-866-740-4740. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Colin Furness, an infection control epidemiologist and assistant professor at the University of Toronto's Faculty of Information, and Dr. Ray Dionand, an epidemiologist and associate professor in the Faculty of of Health Sciences at the University of Ottawa. Hello and Merry Christmas. Hello. Uh, So first of all, I really want to say how much we appreciate your time and all the good information that you give us, especially today, but every day because we talk to you often and and thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Let's get to it then. So uh, we've just heard about a new variant, uh, I think, in Nigeria from Africa. Originally, the reporting was that the the mutation from England had gone to South Africa, but it looks like South Africa has their own mutation, and that's what viruses do. So what does it all mean that there are mutations of the virus, Colin? All viruses mutate. And some viruses mutate a lot faster than others. COVID is a slow poke, and, and that is uh, the coronavirus is a very slow mutator. That's actually really good news. So this isn't unexpected. And the other thing to think about is that, is that as coronavirus has adapted to humans or is adapting to humans, it is going to mutate and evolve in a way to be more contagious. So it's not a surprise, and we don't see enhanced danger. What we do worry about, though, is obviously more cases before we're able to get people vaccinated and and more strain on our healthcare system. That's the big worry. Okay, now what we've heard about at least the UK mutation so far is it's more contagious, but not more deadly, not more dangerous. Dr. Dionandan Ray, um, how do we know that if it's so new? Well, first of all, it's not clear that it's more transmissible, more contagious. It seems a logical assumption to make. So uh, the places where it's been detected in England, it's the most common strain in the places where the cases are spiking. So you can make the conclusion that, in fact, it is more infectious. We don't know if it's more lethal. It probably isn't. But how do you define lethality? Is it if you get this strain, are you more likely to die? What if it isn't? What if it's just more transmissible? In which case, it's more likely to get into more vulnerable populations and they're more likely to die. So the different ways of measuring lethality. The big question, of course, is will the vaccine still work on it? And it looks like the answer to that is yes. So there's no reason to panic. Okay, well, again, so how do we know that? 
Because the mutations, to the extent that we've studied them, it looks like 99% of the proteins on the surface of the virus have not changed. And that's how the vaccines recognize it, by the proteins on the surface. Now, we'll know for sure in a couple of weeks because all the big drug companies are testing their vaccines against the new strain. But um, all signs point to right now the vaccine is working fine. Well, that is definitely reassuring. Um, Dr. Furness, so we have closed our border to the UK until January 6th. Is, is, is that going to do anything given that we're hearing about uh, versions from different parts of the world? Every time we try and get out in front of coronavirus by closing things, we discover that it, it beat us to it. It's probably already here. It was probably here before it was noticed, and that's unfortunate. The bigger question isn't, is a travel restriction from the UK going to help? The bigger question is, what are we doing with open skies? Why do we have planes in the air? Why are we, why are we fostering international travel? Why do I get seat sale emails from Air Canada almost every day? Me too. <laughs> this makes no sense. Like, that's just incredibly dangerous for Canadians. We need to stop traveling. We just need to stop traveling for a few months. Okay. The other thing is, now, the the Premier went on one of his famous rants saying we need to have testing at the airport, testing of inbound passengers. My observation for these things, uh, you know, that he was shot down by others who said that really only 1% of the cases are coming in from the airport. And my observation is we really can barely test the people locally who have to be tested. He said, if if the federal government doesn't do it, we will. Well, with what? Um, who wants to take that? Uh, I'll take it. It's right speaking. Uh, first, if you look around the world at the countries that have done a good job of controlling COVID, they've got three things in common. Number one, they acted early and hard. Number two, they got really good at case detection. And number three, they patrolled their border as well for incoming infection. So to that extent, it's not a bad idea to make sure that incoming travelers are not infected if you have the capacity to test. It's a good place to put our rapid testing capacity in place. But keep in mind, just because you test negative, it doesn't mean you're not infected. It just means you're probably not infectious at that moment. So it's not a passport to go walking around society. It just means maybe we can shorten your quarantine. So I'm never opposed to more testing if, in fact, you have the capacity to do so. Uh, Do we have the capacity to do so, Dr. Furness, do you think? Well, I think if if it were up to me, and honestly, I'm I'm increasingly wishing it were up to me, we would be growing our testing capacity. We would have been growing our testing capacity through things like pool testing and and essentially just adding more bodies to the to the process so that we could do what we really need to do, which is put public health in schools, test in schools. We don't see big transmission in schools, but whenever we find a case, we're going to find an infected family. So for Mr. Ford to have absolutely avoided doing any kind of systematic surveillance testing in schools for four months and then turn around and point fingers at the airport is just a bit baffling to me, to be honest. We should be focusing on community transmission. We should be limiting travel and focusing our testing on community transmission. I think Mr. Ford has mismanaged it, and I think he's trying to distract attention. Well, I was quite shocked talking to a a colleague who has kids in school, uh, because, you know, I haven't been, frankly, we deal mostly with an older population. So uh, he put it to me this way, that if your kid has an exposure, your kid has to be isolated but his the kids siblings even if he shares a bedroom with them they don't have to be isolated they can keep going to school that child's parents can go to work so i mean <laughs> I, I don't know uh, am am i uh, is, i it doesn't sound reasonable to me but i don't know is it, what's the professional opinion is that reasonable that's a tough balancing act. I have two kids in in, uh, in school as well, and the guidance has been changing in Toronto. Uh, it's changed actually quite a lot, just depending on what we think the risk looks like. There's no easy way to answer that, because when you make everyone stay home, you actually cause a great deal of uh, of economic harm. Absolutely. Harm. So it's, it's difficult. We don't see a lot of transmission among kids. I don't think the guidance is out of line, 
But again, we would be doing uh, everyone a favor by taking public health back into schools where it used to be. We used to do vaccinations in schools. Public health is, and schools go together really well, and testing would actually really, really shine a really strong light on where COVID is and, and how to get at it and how to isolate and how to bring those cases down. And do either of you know what happened to these rapid testing kits? We've heard they're here. We've heard they're not being distributed. One idea was to put them in long-term care so people could be tested all the time. Uh, you want them in schools. But where are they? And, uh, you know, even the rules for who will get a test from public health if you have an outbreak in an essential service, there are a lot of people who who uh, won't get tested who would like to get their hands on rapid tests just for peace of mind. Where are they? Silence. Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll take a shot of that. I don't know where they are. I hear rumors that they're being trialed in, in surveillance settings in schools and places like that, but not at a wide-scale basis. Keep in mind, there are different kinds of rapid tests. There's some that require healthcare workers to actually implement the test because they're swabs. There's some that don't. There's some that require it to be sent to a lab still, even though the turnaround is faster. So the nature of the technology is variable. The, the issue is that rapid tests are not great. They have a, a high proportion of false readings, which is not a reason not to use them, though. It just belies the need for more imagination and creativity and strategic thought about how to use them. Other jurisdictions have showed us how. So it's a bit baffling to me that we have not used them strategically at all. Um, yeah, and uh, the other thing that seems to be cropping up, there are private testing places where for a fee, and the fees vary, uh, you can get a test and hopefully get a result quickly. Uh, do Dr. Furness, Colin, do you have a, a view on that? Well, where the government isn't doing testing, it does make sense for employers to step up to fill the gap. You know, is this good public health policy? No. But the number one rule in an outbreak is make it stop, and we need to throw everything we can at it. Um, Mr. Ford's office doesn't have a testing strategy. We have no testing strategy in Ontario. We have no national testing strategy. So it doesn't surprise me that rapid tests are here, that they've been purchased by the federal government and not being used. You need a plan in order to know how to use them, and I, I echo what Dr. Dianandan had to say about different kinds of tests. It's, it's, it's a bit of a complicated landscape, no question. But that's, that's, I think, the main problem that we're dealing with. Well, you know, it's interesting. That was, that was the first of his many rants, is that we need more testing, but uh, the ranting wasn't followed with action, I guess. Uh, it's, it's, it's all quite baffling. Now, it's, it's Christmas Eve. We see lineups at uh, big box stores that have... Uh, just until the end of the day today. Uh, and we've had a huge number of public officials, you know, giving out the message, stay at home, only celebrate in your household, but who knows how well that is going to be followed. So what exactly are you expecting after Christmas? Dr. Dionandon? I'm expecting a surge in cases. And um, I, this gives me no joy to say so, because people have shown us what they are likely to do by looking at the previous holidays, the Thanksgiving holidays, and the American situation in particular was pretty dire. And the Christmas holidays are the time for most family gatherings. Now, I think it'll be better than than it will be in the USA, for sure. We're <laughs> yeah. Good All right. But it looks like there's going to be some gatherings of families, and that will lead to greater transmission. And two, three, four weeks down the line, that will lead to a spike in hospitalizations and in deaths, unfortunately. I think we're at the stage now where maybe we should be thinking about harm reduction, not so much on, on scolding. Since people are going to gather, let's discourage it, first of all, but if they're going to gather, let's look at ways to do so more safely. So I'm hoping that people are, are maintaining their physical distancing and keeping their, particularly their vulnerable uh, loved ones at a great distance and meeting outdoors if they can. Uh, but that's where we are. Yeah, I, I, I don't think the meeting outdoors thing is, is happening, especially the weather is really bad today and tomorrow into tomorrow, though we will be getting a white Christmas. Apparently, uh, Dr. Furness, how do you, I mean, uh, I think if memory serves, the latest modeling says that we're going to hit those 5,000 cases no matter what. Is that right? I'm I'm really concerned about January. My my fear is that people who are gathering 
this weekend, this, the next several days, uh, are going to get infected, and they're not going to have a hospital bed in January. That's my fear, and I'd love to be wrong, but if there is no capacity of our healthcare system breaks, mortality goes way, way, way up. And that's where I think we're headed, and it's, it's, really, it's really concerning to me. Remember, it was only a few weeks ago, only a few weeks ago, that David Williams stood up in public and said he thought that Ontario was going to be in the green zone for Christmas. So he <laughs> set everybody up to have this expectation we're going to get together. No expert would have done that. No epidemiologist would have ever said that. Okay, I think may, I, I, I will say together. this. I think you might be overestimating the attention that people pay to Dr. David Williams, but... And yet, people's behavior seemed to be consistent with that, and and that's concerning. We could have and should have had a really clear message from the beginning of the second wave that said, we're going to have seven or eight ugly months, and if in September and October we'd really pounded the message home that there isn't going to be, there can't be a Christmas with lots of gatherings, I think we might be in a better place now. Okay, well, uh, we are out of time. Merry Christmas to you both, but what would you like to leave us with as we head into the holidays, starting with Ray? I think it's always in the hands of citizens to do the right thing. Regardless of what the government tells you, we can always limit our individual exposures. So let's do that, and let's, let's celebrate greater in a few months when the vaccine has good penetration. Okay, and call it? Masks work. If you're going to be with other people, please put on a mask. It's the most important thing you could do right now. Okay. Well, Merry Christmas. And again, thank you so much. And we'll be talking to you in the new year, I'm sure. And I hope that uh, people take those messages to heart. And uh, our worst predictions do not come true. Let's hope for a good holiday. Thank you so much, Dr. Ray Dionandon and Dr. Colin Furness. You're listening to an exclusive podcast of Fight Back on Zoomer Radio. Heard weekdays from noon to one. You're listening to an exclusive podcast from the Zoomer Podcast Network. Home of great shows like Ages and Icons, featuring in-depth interviews with cultural luminaries from the Zoomer generation. And The Conspiracy Show, where host Richard Serrett uncovers the out of sight and unexplained. Find them and many other fantastic podcasts by searching for the Zoomer Podcast Network in your favorite podcasting app.